but welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah? Um, okay, great. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, Hugh Hayden. And uh, this talk is being held on the occasion of Wycombe's 50th anniversary exhibition, uh, which is up at the gallery through Saturday, July the 31st is the last day. And it's uh, a partial account of many of the things that took place at 112 Green Street and White Combs over the past 50 years, the last half century. And uh, that includes uh, the 2018 exhibition, uh, Hughes' solo debut, uh, which is partly what we're hoping to talk about this afternoon. Uh, the talk's also happening on the occasion of Hughes' uh, extraordinary show at the Listen Gallery in New York, which opened a couple of weeks ago and got a great review in the New York Times this week, uh, which will be in print on Friday, but it's online now, and called Huey, uh, which runs through August 16th. So if you haven't had a chance 13th. to see what? August 13th. August 13th. And uh, if you haven't had a chance, if you're in New York and you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition, uh, I encourage you to do so. It's, uh, it's wonderful. So this afternoon, uh, the idea really is to talk about with you about the exhibition he made at White Combs and some of the things leading up to that. And then also to talk about that in the light of the recent exhibition, Huey, which was about three years ago. So there's roughly three years uh, between the show you did at White Combs and the current exhibition on view in New York. So uh, thanks for joining us wherever you are in the world. And like all of the talks in this series, um, they're being recorded and they'll eventually be archived on White Combs website uh, in uh, perpetuity uh, forever. Uh, so I just want to briefly introduce Hugh Hayden. Uh, he was born in 1983 in Texas and grew up in Dallas. And uh, his first degree uh, was in 2007 in architecture uh, from Cornell University. And then 11 years later, uh, received an MFA in visual arts uh, from Columbia University in New York City. Uh, around the same time uh, as his exhibition at White Columns. Uh, as I mentioned, Hugh's solo exhibition debut took place at White Combs uh, in 2018, and he's had subsequent solo exhibitions at the Princeton University Art Gallery, which was an art museum, sorry, which was in 2020. Uh, he's had shows with Listen Gallery in New York in 2018, and the current exhibition in 2021, and also an exhibition with Listen at the London Gallery in 2020. And he had two exhibitions with Clearing in Brussels. Uh, the first in 2017, and one which recently closed, I believe, uh, in 2021. Is that still on or is it closed here? It, it just closed. Just closed. Uh, in 2020, and perhaps we can talk about this, uh, Hugh initiated the Solomon B. Hayden Fellowship at Columbia University in collaboration with Clearing and Listen uh, to support diverse voices in art. And the fellowship is named uh, for Hugh's late father uh, about who you said, and this I'm quoting you now, Hugh, you said that uh, your father encouraged and instilled in my brother and me an enduring ethic to aim high, to follow our dreams, whatever they may be, no matter how difficult, and to always give 110%. Um, so with that introduction, uh, the first image you can see on the screen, hopefully you can see the images. Uh, this shows Hugh, a young Hugh Hayden, uh, in 2018, all of three years ago, uh, White Combs uh, installing his exhibition here. But I really wanted to begin our conversation here with, and it's mentioned actually in the New York Times, which I thought was interesting, it was mentioned in the review today, that your first degree was in architecture. And when myself and Aaron Somerville from White Combs came to visit you in your studio in Columbia, and right at the beginning of 2018, I, I believe you are still working as an architect for Starbucks in their architecture department. Yeah, I was working uh, in-house for Starbucks on uh, new concepts in New York City and Long Island. I had been working there about a year and a half from when I started grad school. And then I essentially convinced my, the team, my, my bosses, the team I was on that I could do both. And essentially I worked 75% 70, of my original like workload um and you know and you know relative and then i had to had an unusual schedule based off of my classes and so 
you know, um, there were a couple of days, sometimes I would have off, but other times I'd be traveling back and forth to the office, hopefully just once a day, um, depending on my classes. But then I would be at the studio all night, getting home at 4 a.m. every night. So the, yeah, giving 110%, but I mean, can you maybe just say something about how you gravitated towards architecture in the first place? And then how, I don't know if it's, you became disappointed with architecture as a discipline or as a practice, but how you made the decision to move towards sculpture and art making in that transitional period. So that, you know, there was a decade between you graduating from Cornell and you graduating from Columbia, but the, the, the methodology of architecture seems to me to be a, a, still a recurring strain in your work. Um, I would say when I was a, um, in high school, I was um, got obsessed with having a koi pond and I ended up, I was like, became the youngest person in the North Texas Koi and Water Garden Society. I was 15 and, uh, and I, uh, this was like in 1999, it was like pre-internet. Well, the internet kind of was around. I used the yellow pages to like find where to go to get the supplies. But I was actually got really into designing like landscapes and like this like pond and I, I actually thought I wanted to be a landscape artist and would travel around the world design landscapes that were like, uh, I don't know, whatever. And, but that wasn't like a job description and I'm like the SAT or like pre-SAT, you couldn't get to put like your job and career interests. And I think landscape architecture was the closest thing to it. But ultimately I had to, when I finally did pick a career path, um, I felt as an architect could, um, could design landscape, but I didn't think a landscape architect could design a building. So I just pursued architecture and that there was this sort of, I would now say post-rationalizing, it's sort of like at Cornell it was sort of like a creative problem solving uh, education. Uh, and so you could say I've kind of have now become that landscape artist I wanted to be, although I'm not necessarily working at the scale of a landscape, but I'm using like materials from the landscape. But so, so I would say that was always there. I've always loved gardening. Um, even like there are plants I planted when I was in high school that still come up at my parents' house. Um, but the actual transition from architecture to um, to becoming a full-time artist, you know, there there was a, a period of I, I always went to part these sort of private schools or like competitive, like talented and gifted schools where uh, the aim wasn't for someone to become an artist. Uh, like it was to become like a doctor, a lawyer, or a business person. I, I became architect. My brother was a lawyer, and uh, being an artist wasn't. I didn't even know. Wasn't it until like I was like living in New York, like two years out of out of undergrad, that I met two or three years. I met uh, Derek Adams, and he was like the first person I met who said they were a full time artist. And I was like, it's like, what you don't make, work a second job? I, I I had no like. We went to art openings just to get free wine or something like, but we I would like, I, or we would go to museums because those were the buildings being designed by Star Architects and to like, to see the newest like cutting edge design, especially at Cornell, it was this idea that architecture was only designing like cultural institutions. But uh, so, so I, but then, you know, I also, um, I did direct this like weird student publication that was almost like a college version of Visionaire while I was at Cornell. And that was a step towards like having a more artistic um, like freedom and creativity. And um, gradually I had started getting ideas with these things I wanted to make. One of them was I had always wanted to do this photo shoot of a uh, corn road golden retriever. And um, I never realized that for the magazine, the student publication, but I wanted to keep on making it. So like uh, when I, my first job in New York in like 2009, it was like, after that, for the, during the recession, I got laid off from it. And during that time, I, I tried to realize that idea. And that was the first artwork I made where I actually commissioned someone to braid, like to cornrow a uh, sheepskin. It sort of went from there in terms of like, that there could be a career path as an artist or, or, or an audience for these ideas that I had. So you never managed the golden retriever? Not yet, I, and I don't think a gold it would be better with like a labradoodle or a or Afghan. But like, <laughs> uh, there, when, there's when you met Derek Adams and you were hanging out and you're starting to go to openings and stuff. I mean, did 
the sort of whatever the atmosphere or atmospherics of the art world did did that seem more conducive to the way you'd started to think about things than say the no. world of architecture no i mean i was still like an outsider in the art world because i wasn't immediately making art and even um when i was making art i was still like an outsider i hadn't gone to grad school even though i started doing different residencies so essentially i started doing like i did the lmcc residency that was like the lower manhattan cultural council that was a real gave me my first sort of somewhat taste of the art world because i would think i was like the only person in my cohort who hadn't gone to grad school and it was like a first time i had a dialogue around my art pra practice in a critical way and having that discussion, but it was all essentially volunteer. And was um, that the first time you had, you know, something that resembled a studio space of your own that you could do stuff in? Yeah, that was a stand and that wasn't like a live work or that was like a, yeah, a dedicated space to produce art. Was that weird just starting to make art in a room? I mean, it was nice to have a separation, uh, you know, uh, and also certain that like that one of the great things about the program is that uh, you brought in outside visitors like art professionals or and also having a community of other artists to discuss your work with. So in a way, it was this space that came along with these different activities, which is not guaranteed in a, any like a private studio that that was like a real hallmark of that program. And that that idea of collegiality and collaboration and cooperation, I mean, is clearly inherent to a discipline like architecture where you know the authorship of work is much more complex perhaps than the authorship typically of an artwork yeah and definitely like a being part of a team and I, 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 I well in different ways that i think being an architect especially in grad school helped me was i mean no it's like pretty much impossible to build a building alone and so Part of that is like I've noticed with a lot of peers of, that are artists, they don't always have the best experience of how to you know work with other people, whether it's other classmates, artists, professors, gallerists, or, or curator or whatever, writer. Um, and then I'm not perfect, but also that you know there that uh, you know just being conscious of other people's like being uh, not concessions, not the best word, but collaborative or, or just being able to work together. But also I would say it helped me, it made me really disciplined with my time management in grad school because I, ironically, they said that you couldn't work a full-time job in grad school, but I probably was at school the most compared to my peers, but because uh, I, I had to balance my time, so. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll come to it later, but also I'm very interested in your relationship with working with other people, and, and especially maybe we, when we look at the Huey images where there's really, you know, quite complex making. But the, the first image we can see on the screen here, this is in your studio space in Columbia up in uh, Harlem, and this is when myself and Aaron came to visit you. And, you know, you were working in a room that was, you know, probably 200 square feet, and the room was very full of things, I remember, from the time when we visited you. And at this point, you were mostly making things yourself. Is that true? Yes. Um, the, the first is a, a kind of classic lawn chair. Not around that chair. Yeah, made from repurposed tree branches. And then we're looking at, what's this object? This, uh, I, I spent that previous summer driving around like upstate New York and Connecticut and New Jersey getting vintage farm tools off of Craigslist. And essentially it's like a collage of um, these old agricultural tools with African uh, wooden figures to make sort of a, tor a torso and, and, and with, well, some tree branches uh, mixed in. And so there was almost like this, I think of that uh, American Gothic um, uh, sort of painting. This is another studio view with this, the same work in the background and a, a suspended uh, chain, chain piece, carved. Yeah, that was a, um, a dead blue spruce that had died in St. Nicholas Park, which I walked through when I had the, when I was able to like on a weekend walk from my uh, apartment to the studio and this tree, I saw the light, it's, I saw it slowly die. And 
and then it was opportunity to use it as an artwork. And so, um, and now I've, I've developed a connection to the park with the parks department. So I'm able to um, get trees uh, when they need to get removed or, I mean, although now, I mean, I'm not always making things with branches now, but. Um, when you when you arrived at Columbia, so I'm guessing in 2006, it's a two year program, I think. Was this way of working, this sort of methodology, which you know you're you're now known for, uh, was it? Did you arrive with this way of working in hand, or is this something that evolved and developed or accelerated during your time at Columbia? Because this is the first work of yours that I encountered. These sort of extraordinary furniture you know, furniture, dysfunctional furniture pieces. But how did you happen on this way of working? And I guess one of the things that I'm interested in and was interesting then, and it's perhaps even more amplified now in your work is your relationship to materials and your, your specific interest in the kind of social and cultural narratives that are embedded in certain kinds of materials. But these sort of aspects of your practice were, very became very developed during your time at Columbia. Yeah, I mean, I I had made a one wood carving before, where I used all the wrong tools to to make it this particular piece, and then um, but I think it was right when I was uh, started Columbia, I was um passed by like a, I was staying at a friend's house temporarily before I could move into my new apartment, and I, there was like a. It was actually in bedside and this like tree had fell down in front of this chase bank and i i kept on eyeing it and i was i knew what i wanted to make i wanted to like carve like a hand out of the wood and eventually then i went back with the saw and like a bag and i cut off piece of a piece of it and that's like the first piece i made at columbia that and it's actually in a show at meredith rosen gallery right now that zach kitnick uh curated and it it's like a hand where the um fingers uh, turn into uh, or our branches or it's sort of like that. And it's, uh, it's still called like a self-portrait of the artist. It's almost kind of Lord of the Ringsy maybe, but um, yeah, I started, you know, there was a the, the part of, I guess there was a greater interest in my work in camouflage. And so there were the, uh, this was just a new iteration. It was a little more back to basics per se in that, um, previously, I was looking at, at the camouflage on bird feathers of how they can blend into an environment or um, the layering of clothing as an exploration of growth and a person and the changing sizes. And this was like a new body of work that was actually just what if you actually use branches and parts of trees as the camouflage, like a ghillie suit almost, and it grew out of that. And I mean, you know, the works have a kind of, uh, I mean, when you're new to carving, because I mean, it, it, the works don't necessarily have an expert carving quality, but they have an entirely appropriate resolved aspect to them. I mean, it's, it seemed to me at this time that you, were you learning as you were making? Yeah, um, even on that chain piece, the the top of it you can't tell so much in this photo but the the top is executed better in my opinion than the bottom pieces because i started at the bottom first and, and especially a lot of these earlier pieces are more like figuring out how to do it and even in, in general a lot of my works are um uh, until recently i didn't make like maquettes or like test pieces of something like they're just one off things and kind of if I got a new if I got an idea of oh I should do it differently in this piece typically I, I won't just switch paths while I'm working on something because of the time or the scarcity of the materials and that rather I explore that new idea in the subsequent piece if I have you know have the opportunity to make it but the, the relationship to craft which you know has often been sort of debased as a as a kind of uh, you know process or medium or form within fine art that sort of idea of the relationship between craft and making and the kind of history of craft and making or the many histories of craft and making also seem to be foregrounded in these works. Yeah, I mean, and there's, um, there's also like a stride, I mean, uh, 
there's, I mean, it's a, it's a very self-taught discovery. I mean, also, I don't come from an art historical background, so I don't have the same uh, allegiance to like terms like craft and and uh, things that some of my peers or people like from. A, and I actually, I'm, sometimes I'm proud of that. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I wish I knew more like about an art history context. So, but a little bit of, but, but coming from architecture, I've been able to avoid some of the like uh, classification and, and like limiting of how to look at my work. And that a lot of, I would say, I would credit more with my ar architecture background is this idea of like creative problem solving and discovering and figuring out and innovating and discovering the possibilities of material and exploring it that way. And then like using that material for what it's best suited. And and like it really as a, as a work of art, you know, you know, really um, giving it those those traits and ability to shine, you know, and, and like you know, and using them in structural ways and aesthetic ways and, and whatnot. So the, around this time, you know, myself and Aaron from Ycoms invited you to, you know, make a show at Ycoms relatively shortly after this. It was about four or five months later, and it sort of coincided with the MFA shows too. Um, the next images we have are of the works that you presented a white comms. This was part of the opening shows in our new space at 91 Horatio Street. Um, this is a piece from 2018, it's called Hangers. And we have some details of the work, which I can show too, so that people can see more clearly what it is, but it's essentially a, a carved human skeleton. Is it, I, I believe from found Christmas trees, abandoned Christmas trees? Yeah, or, or I, now I say like salvaged. Salvaged? That they were recovered, yeah. But that winter, so that previous winter, the, the, the December that had just passed, um, you'd collected these materials like from the street or from the city or from both or? Combination, some of them never even made it to um, someone's house. They, they were like, like <laughs> it was literally like on Christmas day that a lot of those people selling them, if they don't sell, if they don't, no one buys, buys them that night. They they like abandon them. Eventually, somewhat they get picked up, but it, it's a mix. Yeah, the, the sellers abandon the trees. This is you installing, and I remember everything was you know relatively last minute that the work was being resolved. Uh, some of the technical things were being resolved during the installation. This is a detail of one of the joints on I assume the leg. And then this was the other work that you presented at White Cons, which is called Briar's Patch. Briar Patch, uh huh. And it's a group of six standard kind of American, very different to what you might encounter, I think, in the UK. But school that school chairs that have these folding folding desks and some details. Well, these can't fold, but right, but theoretically. And the uh, and a right-handed position, and I I know sometimes there's a question of, but did you grow up with a wooden desk like this? Because I mean, this is like an old design for a wooden desk for a school desk, but it's also kind of an archetype. And yet, yeah, growing up in the '80s and '90s in Texas, odds are you were you encountered a variety of desks. I I think I never went to school where every classroom had the exact same desk because the way schools grow and also need to replace things. Plus it was a brand new school, it would rarely all have the same matching desk for every classroom. I mean, I mean the classroom would match, but not every classroom would have a desk made from the and one period of time. Can you say something about the genesis of these two works? I mean, on the, on the one hand, the, the, the installation of the, the chairs, they faced the gallery window in the street so the passerby could see the work without even stepping into the gallery. And the, the position of the viewer there was as if they were the head of the class, almost like in the position of a teacher perhaps. And then the, the other work, Hangers, which was in an adjacent space, you didn't see both works together. Uh, you know, had a death-like because of the skeleton quality. The classroom suggests growth and potential and the, the skeleton piece suggested a kind of sort of mortality or finality, but can you just say something of, you know, how you approach the exhibition you made at White Combs and some of the kind of genealogy of these two works, because I believe from talking to you earlier that 
these are motifs that you'll return to uh, with a public work for Madison Square Park in next year, you'll return to Briar's Patch. And the skeleton work will find another form in an exhibition you're making in the Miami ICA this coming December. But in 2018, whilst you were still at Columbia, these, these, what were you thinking about with these works? Well, it's still the overarching common theme with my work, I would say, is this idea of inhabiting the American dream and, and, uh, and that it's a, it's a difficult space to inhabit yet desirable, as well as that this idea of camouflaging, using camouflage as this motif as this way of blending in or assimilation. So the, the idea of if the forest is, a, is society, your one's ability to like literally camouflage yourself is becoming part of that. Um, and then, and then things like with thorns or things that like prohibit your, your assimilation or, or, or keep other people out. So th that I would say is like one art, an overarching theme and with the skeleton with hangers, part of it for me was thinking about, you know, most people have no clue what type of trees these are since there are no le ne leaves or needles. Um, like are they apple trees? I mean, it's not a palm tree, but are they apple trees? Are they pine trees? Are they fir trees, oak trees? And this idea that they had no race, they had no identity, they had no gender, and that they were just a skeleton. Yeah, a, a, a doctor can actually tell someone's you know race and gender from their skull or, and their pelvis. Uh, but the general public, these are like, uh, for me, they were like identityless uh, as a, and that the, just like a hanger and that the, the leaves would sort of create the, the the identity or the type of person that this was and so it was kind of looking at this sort of bare essentials of this someone kind of becoming like an american or like the or or or, or like this sort of and um very um like basic reduced down person or this ability to to sort of become a person and and then briar patch is somewhat um Regardless of the sort of briar patch uh, fair, uh, folk tale of this rabbit that finds a place of um, comfort and security in a place that is normally off limits, scary and uninviting to all the other animals that are trying to attack him or or, or just don't don't want to stay away from that, uh, the piece on its own keeps you out. Like in the installation in the room. You can't tell from the photos, but it was like a, a, a nice and, you know, we could come back to like the architectural aspect of how the, my works are installed, but uh, the piece is like, what I really like about these multiple desks with branches growing out of them uh, was that these individual objects became one thing and their interconnectedness and like the branches created like a force field sort of around them they became a bigger whole, they're part of something else. Um, also, a lot of my works, I kind of think of as they're like specimens from another universe or a larger, like a sampling of something. But um, it had kind of, a, it was only after then, so I was like, oh, what if we had mirrors on the wall that would make it look infinite? But the- um, Which but, is an idea that you developed to the installation of the shed, which we don't have pictures of here, but I hope many people had a chance to see. Yeah, and, and in that way, and only doing it, expanding in a linear way, so it actually becomes a street. So it's not just that we can make an infinite, so just make a forest, but you can have more of a common on common on suburbia and a repeated line that's like a hedge or or a street. But um, but in the case of yeah, the briar patch, it's this idea of education, clearly from its like school desk, but also this this thing that's hard to inhabit. Um, but particular, but maybe someone can find comfort and excel and thrive in this environment. In this environment, there's also notions of, um, uh, well, yeah, thinking about access to it and sort of um, who's it for, and even student loans as as this, as this thing that's helpful but difficult again to inhabit. Um, and and um, and then finally, although I like I'm like. I wouldn't say it's intentionally like related 
to climate change, but it's inherent that there's probably like some, like you could find some ecological issues in terms of like education of the environment and sort of our interconnected to inter interconnectivity to it. And you know the 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 short white columns is almost exactly three years ago. Um, can, maybe you can say something about you know the, the reactions to the show at the time. You know certainly from white columns understanding it was extremely positive, and a lot of people were either seeing your work for the first time or in a more concentrated way, because your work had been in a you know a number of interesting group show situations prior to that, but. In hindsight, how, how did the how do you see this show now in terms of what it triggered or what came immediately after? Well, it was a great opportunity and catalyst uh, for me to sort of realize uh, not, not not my wildest dreams, but my imagination and and like you know, big thing in the art world is having just like a. Uh, uh, not even that say resources, but he having a, an exhibition opportunity as a way to show the exhibit your ideas, especially when they not, won't necessarily communicate well on Instagram or in a digital means. And that I, I really love when most people who see my work in person say it's best experience in person. And I think we are human beings, and ultimately, uh, there is some there is some advantage to being able to experience things in real life over. Uh, digitally and so um but it, and and again that and so yeah i mean it was an excellent opportunity uh you know to a space to because then it was like oh i could have this my thesis show um i had something else in my thesis show that was very different than this um but you know it was you know also as a, a, a it was a great like launching pad of visibility you know in terms of uh People being able to see my work, and you know, and seeing a range of the work, and and I'm not and I wasn't like concerned with selling the work. It was it was more about you know having like an ambitious idea, and this opportunity to show it. The the materials were per se free to make, but I mean there, there were costs related to uh, to it and a lot of labor too. But um, uh, I, I think I think one of the things that interests me is that you know the these two works uh, and this way of working, which you know is now consistent through the practice since. But with these two works specifically, they are obviously works that continue to resonate for you, and they still have work to do, or there's more work to be done with these thoughts that are obviously now going to manifest in. Even an even more public way, which is in literally in the public sense at Madison Square Park in January, where is it a hundred? There'll be a hundred. And also at these to me are kind of really basic. Well, some goal of mine as an artist is like to transform the way you think about some things that are very ubiquitous or taken for granted around you. Like a tree, if I can if I can change how you think about a tree, I can change how you think about other things. And or also a skeleton, although we never see our own skeleton, hopefully. People are so familiar with it, as well as a desk, like and there are these sort of not archetypal things that sort of like there can be identityless. And so I, I think like the best critique of my work is not to call it black, but to call it American, or, or that it's about this experience that is not limited to one audience. And that I or it's more of a compliment for me when someone says, you know, this is something I could relate to in XYZ way. And then often different viewers come to my work in different ways. Uh, that it's not um, sometimes in ways that I don't even, you know, not, not it's not why I made it or whatever. But I love hearing what other people have to say about the work because 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 part of me as an architect, you can never design a building. You know, for one experience, and so I, probably that comes into my artwork where it's there. It's sort of yeah, I have, I have some some something that drove me. I mean, you couldn't just just throw the piece of wood on the table saw and hope it turns out okay. But um, there's some intention in it. But I, you know, it is kind of there's an open and openness to it um, that it hopefully doesn't preclude what it can be how it can be interpreted. And, and that idea for yourself in terms of thinking and making of revisiting uh, 
an earlier thought or an earlier idea, or in this case, and even an earlier work. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 for me, there's something just very interesting, that idea that these things are, remain unresolved in some respects for you. Well, um, and all, not only, not to say, I, I don't necessarily unresolved, but, but like, that, that with more resources, you know, it can 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 reach new heights and new audiences and and and, and fine tune. And so, you know, I, I I think for the space at White Columns, this that this was like an excellent use of that space. You know, architecturally, you know, the if the audience didn't see it, this this work is quite claustrophobically installed between two walls, and to move down the sides of it was almost impossible without in some way damaging the work. Yeah, and, but also that there was like the only those two doorways where there was a you could be at the head of the class or, or in the class, right. and like um, so there they, it created like even that such a fixed sculpture could have a could have a front and a back, um, so like that's something. But also I guess the desk will even at Madison Square Park there will be a front, there there will be a direction like because the nature of a school desk is there. They imply that they're facing a, a direction, but um, I. Uh, but yeah, also there with more resources, and, and also one of the thing is I've always wanted to see these branch works outside, and and so the because uh, because they've always been divorced from nature for a variety of reasons, but uh, this will be the first time I'm making one of these pieces that's intended to be outside. So what does it look like when the seasons change? Or what does it look like when birds are on it or when snow is on it? I think that will add a whole, because remember there was an idea of like having canaries. Oh yeah. <laughs> in, in the room, uh, which you be, got vetoed, but the, uh, but the idea that that can happen naturally. And I think that adds, uh, will be, create, be able to create other experiences that were not possible to replicate in a gallery setting. I think, you know, and also just to clarify my, my, you know, use of the word unresolved, I think what I really mean is that the ideas remain in flux. And, you know, I think that's one of the things I find really interesting about following your work over the last three years is that there are recurring themes in their work, there's recurring images in the work. And it seems to me that, that there's never a point where there's closure. The ideas seem to somehow continue to reverberate, continue to expand, which maybe, you know, you, you address. So maybe that's a good point to bring us to the current exhibition, Huey, obviously a lot's happened for you in the last three years. As we said at the beginning, you've done a number of exhibitions in different situations and places. And the current exhibition, which we're seeing in a, an installation image of now at the Listen Gallery in New York, if you're not in New York or you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition yet, this is the view as you enter the gallery from the street and you're looking through these two archways into three quite distinct spaces that have very different kind of work and very kind of different atmospheres. And, you know, what you just mentioned before about, you know, the idea of the American dream or Americanness or to be American. And perhaps just, I'll go through the three images of the three rooms and you can sort of just help people explain or understand what they're looking at. So this is the first room. And what are they seeing here? Uh, yeah, the space is sort of, you know, uh, set up on an axis with these gothic arches sep sep with of the two walls separating the spaces so that there's sort of a uh, ecclesiastical or, or sort of church-like quality. And so for me, this first room is like a sanctuary for the congregation. There are these church pews that were, you know, salvaged off of Craigslist that um, I worked with a uh, bristle fabric uh, uh, fabricator uh, to sort of impregnate with uh, nylon bristles that would be used on a heavy duty machine to um, to clean something. Uh, they even like make bristles for like the Mars Rover. Um, and they actually uh, did uh, work with Richard Archwaker too. But the, um, so there's ideas of cleanliness and appearance and all the bristled works that are in this room, in this space uh, sort of encapsulate this idea of, of of, of cleanliness related to appearance or, or your sins, or even like thinking of Robert Gober's sinks and this idea of, of you know, of, to be able to, to scrub or wash away. And also there's an idea of ergonomics in all of the pieces and that some people may find it comfortable and some people won't. Um, 
and it, they're all the bristles are impregnated in wooden objects. So like a school desk and a, a brush, hairbrush. And now we're into the second room, looking back into that space on the street, which you can see beyond. And you can just see the edges of the, the benches. And in this room, uh, which is a large square room, there are six, yeah. six sculptures of basketball hoops and then a pedestal in the center. Yeah, and this I called it was like this sort of basketball chapel in the center of the space. And each, each uh, this, it, the whole show is called Huey, which is like kind of my nickname as a child. And mostly only people who've known me as a child would call me that now. Um, uh, but it's the notions of my like dad wanting me to, me and my brother be athletes, um, or, 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 but also like to also be smart and get a, you know, have a, like a professional career, but, um, and they all have like fairy tale names or little relations, uh, and like the piece across the way with its kind of vining. It's actually the made out of green briar. What what a briar patch actually is. Which ironically, that piece. It, but it's called fee fi fo fum, off um sort of like from Jack and the Beanstalk, or the piece with the long hair, the long net is called Rapunzel. It's like braided synthetic hair, and it's sort of also this like fairy tale of the, you know, getting the trophy wife, um, or or a little bit these ways, these ways that a way out, um, which is often how athletics are looked at, especially for a lot of uh, people in America is this like, uh, this this way to, to have that American dream. Uh, and the other piece on the right, that's like a combination of rattan and, and vines is called Cinderella. Um, so, so this idea of these fantasy stories that they that provide an escape um, here via athletics. Although the one piece that's a different escape is that is actually the title of the show. It's the the piece called Huey, which looks like the rattan ch chair, um, kind of the one on the left. Um, it, it was in it, it. It was one of the sort of the. It actually generated all of the works in the sh basketball works because. Um, growing up, we had these chairs, and I um, always thought they looked like a basketball uh, backboard. I just think I just only if you could like un redo the bottom. So essentially, I had to teach myself how to how to make that, and it resulted in like making it. And this is the first one I made was made in a really traditional way. You have to soak it for four days, use a torch, make a mold. And I started making these other ones as derivatives of it while I was trying to make the, this one the old fashioned way. And then the final space, um, it sort of is, it was actually kind of inspired by these like Carrie James Marshall paintings where, you know, everything is painted in blackness and this idea of only making sculptures out of ebony and that everything would kind of become invisible, but also even thinking about Ralph, Sel Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. And so there, this piece here, the Adirondack chair is the only thing made out of Texas ebony, which isn't a true, which isn't related to African ebony or goblin ebony. Um, that piece is called Juneteenth. And it's like this idea, it's called, made out of Texas ebony, which is sort of this like humorous joke, my, that it's my identity in wood. And um, calling it Juneteenth is this idea of the, sort of this black person in Texas uh, taking a break. Um, uh, but I also like that the piece in the corner is called 110% and it's like a six panel, a raised panel door with 110% lean um, in the back corner. This idea of moving fast. That's also relates to the quote I said at the beginning about your father and the, the, the commitment. What I think, you know, the, this exhibition, I think especially, although there are traces of this throughout your work, but obviously the title of the work was your childhood nickname, but there are other elements in the show that are quite straightforwardly in perhaps autobiographical. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it fair to say more so than in previous works or is that going too well, far? I definitely leaned into that in this show because I, I, I felt here I was providing context in a variety of ways. Um, and it's, you know, I think one of the, you know, like the, you mentioned with the Adriandak chair that is made of Texas ebony. Mm -hmm. 
can you just say something about you know, the, the, your, your use of materials is very specific, but also you, from the beginning, I think you've been inter very interested in the kind of social and cultural associations, reverberations, meaning, subtexts uh, of materiality, of literally the materials and the way that you use them. I mean, can, can you just, perhaps in relation to this exhibition, you also addressed it in relation to some of the back basketball hoops too. Yeah, and like the Texas Ebony is also rubbed with tiger balm as its oil finish. So the, if you were there on the first couple of days, it had a cinnamon smell, but that's because it has petroleum jelly and like mineral oil is also a petroleum product, which is like the basis of like a butcher block oil. But anyhow, but uh, yeah, this idea and also as an architect that, you know, the woods would have like a, wouldn't just be decorative and by chance that I, and I wouldn't stain wood. This is like, like these woods are black because they are black. Um, and whatever, and as well as all the associations that come with ebony as this wood that is, is black and comes from Africa. Um, and so like the little house called Lincoln Logs, um, but it's like, you know, con conflating like this ebony log cabin with like a link, Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation and say 40 acres and a mule. But there, there for me, yeah, there's this idea that the material history of, of of the things that I'm using can, and if you, you don't necessarily have to know that it's how, that I went and cut that wood down on the US-Mexico border. But if you do, it can, can, can provide greater insight, but more than likely, I'm also using co colors of woods that you might not have seen before. Um, and um, and that, that room is a little unusual because all the pieces are relatively cut with a piece of, like a machine, like in a conventional wood shop, um, versus like in this in this uh, in this room, the, there's one piece called Fruity, uh, that called the pink like uh, basketball hoop, and it's dyed with Gatorade, and so it's it's actually the red is like fruit punch, the yellow is like the what is it, lemon lime, and the blue is like Arctic frost, or there's a new name for it now, but. And then, it, but it's called fruity, which is like, it kind of means like it's kind of clear, gay, um, and sort of like playing with that in this sort of Easter, it, people thought it was like Easter basket colors. But um, yeah, there's there's different like, like puns and playing in, in the work. This basket, this uh, football helmet in the center, center is also called a brainwash. Um, it, it has like boar hair all in the, in the, what's the black that is, um, I, mean, I think, I, what was your question? I might have. Well, it was, it's really just about this persistent interest in the work in, in not just the sculpture as an image, but the work as a, you know, material manifestation of an idea, but very specifically that the materials themselves resonate and that they function literally, they function metaphorically, and they make social and cultural illusions that then amplify whatever else might be going on in the work aesthetically or as an image. Yeah, uh, of course. If the, the uh, yeah, it's not, yeah, typically using a piece of wood is never like by chance, even if it is like a piece of pine from Home Depot, which is like, not to say unlikely, but to me, like every ingredient that I use to, let's just like when you make a food dish, every ingredient has a role or a purpose. But it seems um, there's a kind of sort of choreography of all of these things functioning simultaneously in individual works. And then obviously in a you know, very expansive exhibition like this, a very generous exhibition like this, they're being choreographed together in space too. Yeah, and, and also, but I love that it's like very minimal and that, because because I made because also I made a sketching model of the show and the sketching model was pretty set from a, pretty for a while only one thing was edited but the uh, yeah it was pretty it, it it like relatively it's a lot of works in the show actually if you count how many there are but it's like seemingly very sparse but also I, I feels like with all of my shows I've tried to use the innate architecture of the space to enhance the perception of the works. Works can, can exist without this, without the architectural uh, uh, adjustments we've done. 
But you know, this gallery sits under the high line. So there are columns that are in the space and those columns, as I knew I didn't want it to be a big open space, but the walls are somewhat are based off of the columns and their thickness. And that clerestory lighting that sort of creates this like daylit church space is from the on the sides of the high line. So the room in the back is supposed to be like only daylit. So that if you know the best treat is if you go towards the end of the day because it's darker. Um, so um, yeah, it's like you know, like taking advantage of you know, if we're gonna build a wall, why we don't have to build a rectilinear doorway to begin with. You know, the next show after this, they'll just, you know, they will make it into like a rectangle or something, but, you know, it's a little bit, um, you know, we could, you know, use that, that doorway could provide like context, like to the, to the, it's not a piece, but it, 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 it helps elevate the experience of the overall show. And then the show, the one time you'll be able to experience all these works together as a composition. Although I, I wouldn't call it an installation. Uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our allocated time to you. So I just wanted to sort of end perhaps by, because one of the things that I find interesting, you know, tr tracking the work or following the work is that you're, 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 you're very active on social media. And one of the things that you're interested in on social media is, is helping the audience or giving some kind of access to the making process. So for example, I remember you posting videos of you being on the border and sourcing this wood in Texas, but also you've shown that the work is produced often collaboratively or with other people. And just curious about that, that relationship between you know, the, yourself, the studio as a place for collaboration or a site for you know, multiple authors, and then your relationship to sharing that through the vehicle of social media. Well, um, I guess like at, a, like at an architecture firm, like Frank Gehry is not like laying an eye beam. And like, and, and, and so it's sort of like, he's part of a team and you know, he's like hiring the smartest people that help can help innovate his practice and bring new three-dimensional computer technologies and, and, and new like, ability to create a structure and so well i'm not you know with this show i would say i was there was more i did have more assistance and but it was really trying to find the best person to do a particular task like working with people who were carpenters to help with the, the wooden works um i don't know it's, it's also about managing resources and like what is the thing that i need to touch could anyone like anyone who knows how to use a table saw could cut something and build something do I do I have to be involved in every aspect of the creation of that work? Uh, the main thing in this show that had to have be like my like careful involvement with it are the woven rattan works, and that I couldn't tell someone how to weave each each I don't even know what to call each each weave. Like you know, I, I just had to do it myself. Um, but a lot of the other things in the show sort of are um, almost like parametric design, and that um they're very straightforward like system and logic um that and even less so in this show like it's more apparent when the works that have branches that the branches make everything look like they're it's like a confusing and super organic but often there's a very simple structure underneath and it's just the only variable is the the branch and that it the direction it's going and the shape it makes and that um ultimately uh it's um it, it is it's a system at, at, at hand and so yeah but I definitely as i'm like sort of my practice is expanding and i have greater resources and you know this project that's going to be outside in the park you know the scale the size of it that's not something i could do in my studio i don't, I don't have the resources to make that entirely internally also that you know that it needs to stand up to xyz things outside potential blah 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 but um, it's also just being conscious of what I'm able to produce myself. Right. And like, I, I know Aaron always thought it was gonna be hard for me to hand off responsibility, like, you know, and all, but like things like the sculpting of the wood to make something like this, you know, that, that would be more challenging. But like in hindsight, I would rather have someone else spend like 
two days sanding it, then meaning to sand it. Like, uh, so there's like a trade off of, of like the things that I need to do myself versus the what aspects could anyone do as a good command of that skill. Well, thanks you. Uh, really appreciate it. Don't forget to go and see Hugh's show at Listen New York. It's on through August 13th and is really unmissable. And upcoming projects for you, if you're in Miami in December, you'll have an exhibition at the ICA Miami of New Work, I believe. And then in New York from January in Madison Square Park, you'll be able to see the, the much larger manifestation of the school desk works in a new iteration of Briar's Path. So thanks very much, you really appreciate it. Enjoy the summer. And this talk will be recorded, has been recorded, and will be posted to Wycom's website very soon. So thanks again, Hugh. Take care. Good luck. And bye, everybody. <laughs>